Hey, Internet, this is Rudy for Bester Investor coming at you live from Palm Beach in Florida. It is Friday. It is July the 2nd. And that means in the United States, it is Independence Weekend. Independence Day happens to be on Sunday, July the 4th. For the people who are in Canada, happy Canada Day, even though I'm a day late, because July 1 was Canada Day. Hope you had a great day. Hope you had to, uh, an opportunity to spend some time with friends and family. And I hope if you're in the United States, you'll have a great Independence Day and spend that in the, friends, uh, in the company of some friends and relatives and loved ones as well. What I wanted to do today is something just a little different to what I usually do. So I'm not going to be wearing my Mr. Oxy hat. I am actually going to be wearing my generational wealth hat. Now, for the people who've been following my channel, you will know that uh, on several occasions in the past, I've said, let's help one another to uh, create some generational wealth. The questions you might ask is, how do we do that exactly? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a few uh, sort of uh, hints and tips about generational wealth with you in this particular video. So that's the object of today's exercise. It's going to be a little different. And uh, if you wanted to uh, catch up on some news about Occidental Petroleum, this is not the video for you. And um, if you uh, are concerned about my ability to, uh, to educate and entertain, as opposed to talking about uh, energy stocks, then maybe this is not the video for you either. But for the rest of you, hang on tight and enjoy. Well, guys, uh, you know, I shared with you just the other day that um, in the previous video that I that I made, that I had to uh, make a road trip to North Carolina from uh, Florida. And in order to get to North Carolina, I had to drive on a road not dissimilar to this one. And um, I had to travel through South Carolina and Georgia in order to get to North Carolina. The thing that's interesting about a road trip uh, there are three things observational uh, over here, and uh, let me uh, just zoom in just a little bit, and I'll show you what I'm getting at. So let me pause here for a second. So there are three things here that are absolutely energy related. Firstly, all this dark green stuff on either side of the road, those are called trees and bushes and shrubs, and the, this is just the natural, um, effectively, uh, all the flora of uh, the road, whichever road I'm on at this moment in time, these are some pine trees that always, always look a little bit scraggly. These are some oak trees. And of course, these things eat CO2. So for all the people who tell you that um, we are producing too much CO2 and we're all going to die, uh, I can remind you that um, trees regard uh, CO2 as plant food. So I'm not overly concerned about the fact that we're burning too much CO2 because there are more trees today on the planet than what they have ever been before. Let's go a little closer and I'll pause again. This uh, big black thing over here, much like this strip of black stuff that we're driving on, are petroleum-based products. Uh, firstly, there's the asphalt surface of the road that I'm traveling on. And secondly, there's a black thing over here. It is not some kind of roadkill. It is in fact a piece of truck tire, which is also a petroleum product. Then there's a car in front of me, which is also burning some fossil fuels and emitting um, awful uh, carbon monoxide gases uh, and of course contributing to global warming as I am while I'm driving in my car following the car in front of me. But the main thing about all this is you know that as I drive I spend most of my time thinking of you guys and the interactions that we have on our community channel and that's really what I wanted to do today. What I want to talk about specifically is generational wealth. So what I did was I prepared a short little video uh, to kind of cover a few topics on generational wealth. So if this is not something that you're interested in, uh, then you may as well take this immediate left turn over here, exit the video, and uh, I'll catch you on the next one when I talk about uh, something interesting like Occidental Petroleum. For the rest of you, uh, buckle up, buttercups, because what we're going to do is talk a little bit about generational wealth and how to build generational wealth. Okay, hey guys, so the first thing that we have to do, uh, this has got absolutely nothing to do with generational wealth, but we uh, have to absolutely give a shout out to uh, Bulldogs number one, because not only did it remind me to, uh, to watch the actual uh, championship, but in addition to that, 
Oh, by the way, he posted that on the uh, on the community channel under the comments, so all of you were able to actually watch it. But in addition to that, Starkville, the wait is over. Your Bulldogs are national champions. So um, I can tell you this, not only is Bulldogs number one, an exceptionally gifted stock picker, who is the guy who um, introduced me to uh, energy transfer uh, a while back and, and uh, insisted that I take another look at it um, and uh, basically prompted me to uh, take a large position in it. But uh, he's also a very good picker when it comes to picking winning teams because Bulldogs, number one, has actually nailed it and Bulldogs are now number one. So that's on a separate topic, but uh, hey, uh, Bulldogs number one is one of our regular contributors. So I didn't want to sort of skip on the uh, chance to say, well done, Bulldogs. Uh, and that's uh, our kickoff to this particular video. So five tips. I'm not even sure if they're five because some of them overlap to building generational wealth. If you're interested in this, stick with me for a while. I'll show you some things. The first thing that you got to do is you have to make sure that you understand taxes. You don't have to be an expert on taxes. What you want to do is you want to be able to uh, easily identify and understand how you can work with tax deferred accounts. So for instance, in the United States, it's called a 401k and variations they are like a Roth. And then uh, for the Canadian folk who are watching, it's an RRSP, a registered retirement savings plan and variations of that. Um, those are the basic sort of fundamental things that you want to know from a tax point of view, if you are gainfully employed and for example, earning a regular salary. The other things that you want to take uh, particular note of um, are the taxes that you are subject to at federal level, state level, county level, city level, wherever it is that uh, you may call your domicile. So for example, in the case of Mr. Roxy, in case you don't know who that is, that is moi. Um, one of the reasons why I chose Florida as my tax domicile is because Florida doesn't have any state tax on income earned. So I pay federal tax on any income that I earn. And I also pay sales taxes in uh, Palm Beach County, which is where I live. And uh, my sales taxes are 7%. It's a consumption tax. In other words, the more I spend, the more I end up in paying tax, paying in taxes. And then I also pay a whole variety of other taxes, not only the ones that you cannot see, like the taxes tacked onto your gasoline and things like that, but also taxes like property tax, which obviously includes a whole variety of other taxes embedded in property tax, like paying for education, even though I have no, no children at school, everybody pays, and paying for uh, the debt of people who had gone before in my county and my city. Uh, they're debt ridden, like most gov governments are, and they don't have any way to generate additional cash other than by increasing your property taxes. And this is a critical point. Every politician who wants to be elected says, vote for me and I'll cut your taxes. Well, if uh, he or she gets elected, what happens in practice is whether they succeed or whether they do not succeed, they say they want to cut your taxes. Many, many of them do. Even Biden said, if you earn more than $400,000 per year, you're going to pay more taxes. But if you earn less than that, you're not going to pay any more taxes. Of course, that's a lie, but politicians lie all the time. And you know that they're lying because their lips move. What you want to do is make sure that you are aware of taxes. The other thing that you want to be aware of and be familiar with, just at a high level at least, is basic accounting. You want to know that the balance sheet is structured in such a way that assets equal liabilities and the rest is owner's equity. So assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. If you have a $100,000 house and no mortgage and therefore no liability against that $100,000 house, then your owner's equity is $100,000. However, there are two critical things that you need to remember about this. Assets are sort of an aspiration because you can say my house is worth $100,000 because that's what the houses are selling for in this particular area but it's only valued at whatever a willing buyer is prepared to pay you for it when you want to sell it. So if all you can generate on your, on your house is $80,000, even though you thought it was worth $100,000 and you have no mortgage, then your owner's equity or your shareholder equity is $80,000. In other words, assets are firstly variable in terms of valuation because they are somewhat aspirational, whereas liabilities are not. If you have a $100,000 liability to your bank, 
for instance, a mortgage, that is an absolute number because it's $100,000 on paper, you sign for it, you owe it, and it's $100,000 fixed, plus whatever interest they charge you. So assets are a little bit more vague than liabilities, which are absolute. That's also why you see asset uh, numbers uh, subject to things like impairment and depreciation and so on. Um, but these are things that you basically want to be aware of as a starting point. If you are not familiar with basic accounting, take like a little superficial course. You can even do this stuff for free uh, on the web. Just get a basic understanding and a grasp of accounting because it's beneficial to you. You will never really be able to build generational wealth unless you are at least savvy in terms of accounting and uh, taxation as it might apply to you. So that's kind of like the, the first point, which is sort of a, a bucket list of things that you wanna pay attention to, predominantly accounting and tax. Now, the other thing that you can do when you want to build generational wealth is you can buy unique items. Unique items are very, very hard to value. So this little thumbprint here at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen actually says Comptroller's Handbook. This is from the federal government of the United States of America. It is a 140 page document that describes unique and hard to value assets. The reason why they published this uh, ridiculous book is because um, the IRS wants to know, uh, in the case of a US tax person, how much your asset is worth so that when you sell it, they can get some money from you for the tax portion, which is also called your profit. I don't own this uh, 1936 BMW 319 that's in the picture here. I actually took this picture out of uh, a BMW museum in Spartanburg, South Carolina on my recent weekend trip. But I'm posting that picture here for you because if you want to own an asset, this would be an asset because it's a collectible, it's one of a kind, and because it's the only one that's available, to my knowledge anyway, it could be worth an enormous amount of money, especially if you had acquired this as part of your personal vehicle collection 30, 40 years ago and you only paid a couple of thousand dollars for it, today it might be worth a million or more. And the uh, hard to value assets or unique and hard to value assets booklet can actually be downloaded so that you can read it and get familiar with it and then know all the reasons why they value certain things at a certain price and then you can learn to avoid the things that they look out for in terms of taking your money because what they want to do is take your money. In essence, what the government does is when it comes to tax time, the government says, how much money do you have? Please send it. So if you want to avoid being in that kind of situation, you have to be knowledgeable about what you are investing in and what it's worth might be and what your local tax agency might use in order to describe that asset. So these are things that you actually want to know, assuming you're interested in collecting cars. If you're not interested in collecting cars, maybe you want to collect art. Now, this is not just any art. The reason why there are uh, some paintings that are worth a lot of money is because they are hundred or hundreds of years old. And in this particular sample that I'm showing you here, uh, the, the left side screenshot is a still life done by Claude Monet, the uh, relatively famous, or certainly most people would have perhaps heard of Monet, a French painter, and this particular painting was done in 1910. What makes it particularly valuable is not just the paint on the canvas, but the fact that Claude Monet signed all his paintings with this uh, slightly slanted left-leaning uh, signature of his that says Claude Monet. So if you happen to have a very awful painting that looks like this, uh, and it's also uh, featuring a signature by a certain person, in this case, Claude Monet or Rembrandt or Peter Paul Rubens or someone of that nature, you could have something that is worth a lot of money. And once again, it's one of a kind. So you want to know how the IRS values unique and uh, effectively any assets that cannot easily be valued. How about this one? So this is the oldest bottle of any liquor that I have in my house. And this is a 1961. Do not be fooled by these moldy looking spots on the label. The fact that it has a label actually adds to its value. And these little spots that are on the label are actually droplets from bottles above it that have been dripping on it. And that is quite okay. This particular bottle is near and dear to me because in addition to the fact that it's 60 years old, 
It also comes from Cape Town in South Africa, where I was born and raised. When I purchased this particular bottle in around 1990, it cost me $2. And I just uh, Googled it and it um, gave me a little description here and said the most recent global average price we have found for KWV limited release vintage port 1961 is 437 US dollars. That was in 2018. So if we uh, assume I purchased something for $2, uh, regardless of the fact that I purchased it in 1990, which is now almost 30 years ago, my asset has now grown in value to approximately $450. However, it has no value at all. I mean, I could break it, I could open it and drink it, and believe it or not, uh, because it's port, it, its shelf life is almost um, forever. So I could just effectively uh, damage it, I could break it, I could drink it, I could just throw it away, then it has no value at all. Or otherwise I could say, hey, does anybody wanna buy it from me? And then it is worth, in theory, $450. What's its actual value? What a willing buyer is prepared to give me and what I am prepared to accept. So these are unique assets. So I've covered three of them for you. The thing that makes them uh, valuable from a generational wealth point of view is that they are unique. What you uh, should not have an expectation of is to say, if I purchased a car, and let's say for instance, I drove a brand new Mercedes SL500 off the lot, that that somehow has value because it actually does not have value. If you go online and you find yourself a 10 or 15 year old Mercedes Benz SL500 uh, online right now in the United States, you can buy them for like 10, 15, $20,000. Despite the fact that just a few years prior, like 10 years prior, someone drove it off the lot and paid $150,000 for that car. The car has to be, like any other asset, unique, limited, maybe one of a kind, maybe one of 10 or 20 or 100 in the world. And that's a critical point because almost everything that I just showed you is relatively unique. There is only one of those BMWs. There is only one particular Monet in terms of the still life that I, show, that I showed you a minute ago. And there might be a thousand of bottles of KWV 1961 port. Uh, available on the market today. And that's why it's only worth $450 per bottle, say in theory, whilst the BMW might be worth $3.5 million. The other thing just for your interest is KWV is uh, Dutch for Kops of Einmarkers Vereniging, which is the Cape Winemakers Association. That's what KWV stands for. It is uh, also South Africa's most famous export label when it comes to alcoholic beverages. Now, how about this? So this is property. So I, I am not overly uh, keen on investing in property. I do own property. I own residential property. I own commercial property as well. But I have a problem with property. And it's more um, perhaps specific to me because I know there are a number of people who make an enormous amount of money on property, especially if they, um, they buy rental properties used by others on, a, on an ongoing basis, including for uh, residential accommodation or hotels or whatever. I would be interested in that type of a property acquisition, but otherwise I'm a little bit loathsome in terms of property. The, um, the challenge that I have in property is not so much that it's not necessarily uh, a, a good asset. It can be, even though it's one of the poorest performing asset classes in terms of all asset classes available, growing at a clip of around between one and 3% per year, depending on where you might be, which is okay, but you can do a lot better, for instance, in the stock market, and your assets or your investments are 100% liquid if they are in stocks. So I am much more keen on investing in stocks than on property. But if you do want to invest in property and you do want to uh, generate generational wealth, your property needs to be income generating. So in the case of this particular uh, uh, facility that I'm showing you here, you may see TR up there on the flag. This is Tryon. This was actually the resort that I was traveling to in North Carolina. So how did this come about? Tryon is an international equestrian center and a group of partners bought the bankrupt White Oak golfing community in late 2012 for $11 million, then bought adjacent land and built a 1,400 acre resort. The project has already employed 500 construction workers to move 1.6 million cubic feet of earth in the past five months. This dates back a few years to when they purchased it, which was in 2012, so approximately 10 years ago. If you go to Tryon today, they are 
five or maybe six uh, equestrian rings where uh, they do show jumping and, and horse related type of events. And I'm not overly familiar with those, uh, but in other words, the main arena and this building over here actually is also the grandstand if you were on the other side of this building, uh, has a main arena behind it. And then there are like another three or four uh, rings just to the side of it. I went to try on for two reasons. Firstly, I went there because I had tickets to the PBR, which is professional bull riding. And I, I had never seen such a thing before in my life. I had to go and see it. It was just awesome. And I'm going to show you a little clip of that in a minute before we sign off. But, I, but more importantly, I went there because I set up a flagship store for a startup company that I am invested in, which is part of what I'm sharing with you right now. So these guys who built Tryon have now built a um, facility that is so uh, huge. So this is the front of the building that I just showed you. And that's one of the um, uh, equestrian rings behind it. And then there's another few over here on the one side. There's a bull riding uh, facility over here. There are shops over here. There's a whole lot of stuff. And uh, try on the actual resort is hiding underneath my um, pretty little face over here. But I actually had to stay in Greenville, South Carolina. So I had to go and find myself a hotel in Greenville, South Carolina, because the try on event that they had on Saturday, actually three events, they had a car show, they had equestrian events, and they had professional bull riding, uh, caused the uh, area around it, uh, the hotels, Airbnbs, etc. they were sold out for probably um, maybe about a 35, 40 mile radius around Tryon. I just couldn't get accommodation, so I ended up staying in Greenville, which is an absolutely beautiful city. Greenville's downtown, Main Street Greenville is, is eye candy. Uh, and it's a short hop away from uh, Spartanburg, which you can just see off the side of this Google map here. Uh, Spartanburg is the, the home of um, the uh, one of the largest motor car manufacturing facilities in the United States, BMW. And at the same time, uh, Spartanburg also therefore features Zentrum, which is the uh, BMW Museum and uh, a BMW Foundation Museum. But this Tryon Resort that these guys invested in, five families, so family offices have invested approximately $200 million to make Tryon into what it is today. If you want to invest in property, you don't have to buy a $200 million property, but you want to buy a property that creates some kind of wealth for you or a regular income, uh, income stream. That's one of the reasons why someone like Warren Buffett buys farms in addition to buying stock, right? It's got to be income generating. One of the critical things that I mentioned when I talked about the balance sheet is that the assets have to equal the liabilities plus the owner's equity. In accounting terms, an asset is a fixture or a plant and machinery or a building or something of that nature. For you and me, an asset means it's something that generates income. If you stay in a nice house or if you have a nice car and it just does not generate income for you, it's costing you money, then it becomes a liability. It is no longer an asset. Assets make money. The reason why I added this picture here is because if you purchase a property that is not unique, then what you have is a situation where any realtor will say, let's do a CMA, which is a comparative market analysis. And what they will do is they'll say, your property, and let's just assume it's this one in the middle here, is worth $280,000 because all the condos in that particular condo block have been selling for about $280,000. If you purchase the property that you live in, whatever its value is, is whatever it is, because it's a liability, you live in it, so it's costing you money. If you're purchasing a property and you expect it to be an asset that can generate wealth for you, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is, it needs to be unique. If it is not unique, like the car or the painting or the bottle of wine, it is automatically devalued because it's one of many, many, many. Now, if you buy a beachfront condo and it costs you $100,000 and three years later, you sell it for a million dollars, that's great. It's still not an asset unless you actually, uh, for a minute, ignore the appreciated value of the property and say, how much did it cost you in the three years that you owned it? Because during those three years, you might've been servicing a mortgage, you were paying property taxes, you are paying uh, homeowners association or condo fees. And if you add all of that together, 
then suddenly your profit that you made is significantly diluted. However, if you bought that same condo for $100,000 and used it as an Airbnb, and after three years, it's worth a million dollars, not only did you get lucky because of the appreciation, but in addition to that, you have earned income from the property. So when it comes back to real estate, I said earlier on, I'm not like a great fan of real estate because I do better just because of my personal disposition and my knowledge of the stock market. I do better in stocks than what I do with real estate. I don't know enough. People can educate me about real estate if they want to, or if they feel so inclined, I'm willing to listen. But until I find something that outperforms my performance on the stock market, I am less interested in whatever that might be. The, the catchphrase here is real estate investing involves the purchase, ownership, management, rental, and or sale of real estate for profit. Many people purchase a house and they say, I bought this house for whatever, let's say $100,000, and I did really well. Five years later, I sold the house for $170,000. Well, if you work backwards and you say you sold it for $170,000 and during the five years that you owned it, you paid X on property taxes, you paid Y on maintenance, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of things that come into play in terms of you living there and effectively being a consumer as opposed to an investor. So the fact that you generate a $70,000 profit in my example, you should say $70,000 less, 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 and maybe you walked away with 20 grand on your $100,000 investment which is still okay if you're using other people's money. In other words, if you mortgaged it and you take the cost of the mortgage into consideration as well and you make $20,000, it's okay. Then you make 20% over five years, which is actually sort of probably kind of average for the majority of people in terms of real estate or property. The critical thing, and this is probably point number four or five already, start a business. You wanna start a business like today. You have to own a business. The business does not have to be overly elaborate. Um, you don't have to have a 50 page business plan. You can incorporate a uh, business, not a sole proprietorship, but an actual business. So uh, in the United States or Canada, it would be something like an LLC, which is a limited liability corporation. Uh, you don't have to start a corporation. It's easy to start an LLC. It's inexpensive, you set it up. The reason why you do that is because you have the benefit of having your business acquire some assets, which are actually liabilities. So let me give you a practical example. So if I buy myself a car, in accounting terms, that's an asset, but in personal finance terms, it's a liability. Why? Because the car cost me money, then it cost me money to run the car, then I have to maintain the car, and from time to time, I may spend extra money on the car for whatever the case might be. Uh, even if it's a nice smelling thingy that you can hang from the rear, rear view mirror, you're spending money on the car all the time. So the car is a liability. It is not an asset. So what can you do? Well, your business can buy the car. So now you no longer have a car. In other words, right now, as I speak to you at this very moment in time, I actually do not even own a car, but I own a business and the business owns a car. And if the business owns the car, that means the business has to pay the insurance on the car, has to pay for the maintenance on the car, it pays gas to fill up the car, it replaces the tires on the car, and I just get to drive it because I'm the owner of the business. So you want your business to be able to earn some income in order to service that particular liability. Now, the critical difference between a person and a business in tax uh, terminology or in terms of income or wealth is this. When people earn money because they have a job, they earn a gross income, taxes are deducted, and they get to keep what's left over, right? So let's say, for instance, your salary is $1,000 per month, and let's say your tax rate, whatever your taxes might be, is 30%. Your employer is paying you $1,000 per month, because you're not getting $1,000 per month, you just have a gross salary of $1,000 per month. Your employer withholds $300, 30% in taxes to pay to the tax authority and gives you $700. In other words, you earn, taxes are deducted, and you get what's left over. If you own a business, the business earns whatever it's earning, and then you deduct all your expenses and then you pay tax on what is left over. And this is 100% legal. In other words, if your business 
generated a thousand dollars and it had for instance paying for its car and insurance and all that kind of stuff seven hundred dollars worth of expenses per month and it is left with three hundred dollars in profit the business will pay taxes on the three hundred dollars profit that it made so the difference is critical but it is significant if you're an employee you earn money your employer withholds taxes and you get to keep the change if you're a business you earn money you spend on all your expenses and operational costs and you get to pay taxes on what is left over it makes sense because these two things are not the same so by way of an example if you can sell your time to an employer for a thousand dollars per month there's a really good chance that you could sell your business consulting services services to the same employer for a thousand dollars per month so instead of employing you as a person your employer is just employing your corporation and contracting with your company as opposed to with you personally i realize that not many people can just do this instantly and it's not practical in terms of most jobs today because the employer will want to say no i don't need to hire you as a contractor i want to employ you as an employee of course if you're an employee you also get a variety of benefits and things like that so there are advantages to being an employee and i'm not suggesting anyone should leave their job and suddenly become self-employed self-employment is not for everybody and it doesn't work equally well for everybody but even if you have a job and especially if you have a well-paying job there is no reason for you not to start a business so that you can actually start managing your personal tax using the business as a hedge for whatever it is that you do or however much you pay in taxes. This little picture here is not from Tryon. This is actually a small startup company that I invested in, which is called MTC Leathers. And this is based in Palm Beach. And uh, this putting green is just in front of the little building here. And this is the actual warehouse and manufacturing facility of this particular company. And I'm invested in this business. Why am I invested in this business? The uh, company makes absolutely beautiful leather products. And these products are sold at a very, very nice profit, which means that the business has the ability to make a very nice profit. This particular image that I'm, uh, that I'm sharing here with you is from Tryon, the resort that I mentioned earlier. So at Tryon, uh, MTC Leathers has this little flagship store where people come in and buy leather goods. And then as the leather goods are sold, they are replenished. We sell more and it keeps generating revenue on an ongoing basis. And at the same time, the company pays most of our costs. Companies that we own carry the costs of things that you would typically pay out of pocket. So internet connections, uh, cell phone telephones insurance gas for cars etc these are company expenses they are not personal expenses which means my personal expenses are like limited down to um, things like food uh, condo dues you know whatever the case might be so my expenses are really really minimal which is really what you want to get to in terms of being financially independent so that you can generate wealth businesses for sale so if you don't want to start the business, you can buy a business, but there are different ways of buying a business, right? So not everybody will say, well, I have the ability to buy a business. You know, your friend next door or your neighbor might be saying, I want to sell my landscaping business. And you just don't have enough money to buy that landscaping business, so you can't buy it. But that doesn't prevent you or preclude you from buying a business at all. The only difference is, unlike the LLC, as an example that I just shared with you a minute ago, you're not going to be owning the business outright, which means you don't have control and you cannot make decisions. But literally anybody can buy a business and you can do that even today. So how do you buy a business when you don't have a lot of money? Well, you could buy one share of Coca-Cola today. Well, I'm not sure what the price is today because I took this yesterday, this little screenshot, but you can buy a share of Coca-Cola for 55 bucks. That means you own just the tiniest little slither of a publicly traded company with several billions of dollars. Now, often uh, through my charitable foundation, I coach children in, in basic financial acumen because schools don't teach that, right? So I try and cover what the schools don't teach. And uh, I say to them, you know, if you have a hundred dollars in, in birthday or Christmas money or whatever the case might be, if you're lucky enough that someone gave you money, and you have cash, of course you can go and party and you know have fun and do whatever you do, or you can buy a share of Coca-Cola. Uh, which means you've actually just bought a business. 
If you can do that when you're young, this thing is going to be a, worth a ton of money when you get much, much older and bigger. Look at the return on investment all time, 7,500%. But that is nothing because the $7,500 is based on the pure mathematical uh, equation of the graph that you see behind the screenshot below here in terms of Coca-Cola's appreciation since it went public. But here's a better example. Coca-Cola is Warren Buffett's oldest stock position at Berkshire Hathaway. It is providing some of the best returns with the stock market up over 2,000% since the Oracle of Omaha started buying it 33 years ago. Modern investors looking to navigate the next decade would be well served to learn how Buffett made this profitable calculation. His returns are off the charts, much, much greater than just the stock appreciation because this doesn't take into account, this little green graph does not take into account distribution of dividends, stock splits, and things that have happened along the way. Now, I'm going to wrap this part of the presentation up with this quote from Mark Twain. He said, the two most important days in your life are the day that you are born and then the day you find out why. As you build generational wealth and as you get into a situation where you start uh, creating, generating, and driving more revenue than what you need for your day-to-day -day living, cost of living, uh, of course, you're going to keep investing and you're going to grow your investments even greater. But what we did uh, as a family is we started as part of our family office, a charitable foundation, which is called Memory Trees. Now, Memory Trees has a mission of no poverty. But the point I'm making here is uh, it is critical for you to give back. But then what happens is if you're in a fortunate enough position to give back, you actually open up a whole new dimension of generational wealth because organizations that are tax exempt, uh, whatever they might be called, wherever you may be in the world. So in the United States, it's called a 501c3. So you tax exempt, exempt under IRS code 501c3. Because the organization is tax exempt, it does not um, pay taxes on the revenue that it generates. But it generates revenue in a variety of different ways. It sells products. So the charity organization sells products for a profit. So don't confuse not-for-profit or charity with tax-exempt. A tax-exempt organization is, by definition, a charity organization is a great example of a tax-exempt organization, but primarily it is tax-exempt. So it sells products. It sells products at a profit. Then it invests the profit that it makes into charitable programs and ventures. It also receives grant funding from uh, organizations like other charitable foundations, uh, nonprofits, and uh, organizations like Coca Cola might give grant funding for a particular project that they want to fund that the nonprofit uh, would lend itself to. And with that money, the nonprofit can again generate new projects, new programs, and give back to society in that manner. But the tax exempt organization can also pay you a salary. So if you own a charitable foundation, which is no different or uh, only slightly more complex than opening up a, a, a LLC, for example. So now Memory Trees Corporation is a corporation that's tax exempt, or you can also own an LLC. So I have Memory Trees LLC, which is a limited liability corporation or company. You can earn a salary from this organization. Your salary is not tax exempt, but remember I said the company earns money, pays taxes on its profit, and then, I'm sorry, the organization makes money, pays all its expenses, and pays taxes only on its profit portion. In the case of a charitable foundation, it's tax exempt. So it earns money, it can pay you a salary, and of course you're gonna pay taxes on that salary because it's a regular income tax at your regular income rate. Um, and at the same time, it can cover a whole lot of your expenses because your foundation, your charitable foundation, also needs to have a place where you work which has an internet connection. Uh, it may have a vehicle, which means the organization has to pay insurance. Get where I'm going? The corporation can pick up the tab for many, many of the different things that you would otherwise have to pay for out of pocket. So guys, I hope that helps a little because this is a, sort of a, a, a whole smorgasbord of different things that you could possibly do in terms of building generational wealth. What I want to do is I want to get you all into a mindset of saying, how do I manage my income, my taxes, my investments, my uh, 
businesses that I'm going to start and be successful at, how do I bundle that all together and put myself in the best position to potentially win this game of game of life and then give back to others in return. So that's the wrap on generational wealth. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it up with a little video to show you how professional bull riders ride a bull because as Mr. Oxy, I'm still bullish in the market and that's still my primary objective, equity trading. That's what I do, but it's not so much trading, it's more investing. So thanks for watching. Here's the bull ride.